And just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Our true enemy has not yet shown his face. Godfather 3. If you ever seen the Godfather trilogy, Godfather 3, and especially that scene, has a divided class. I mean, anybody who watches Godfather 1, Godfather 2, they all say, you know, fantastic, different degrees, but fantastic. Godfather 3 has the one crew thinks it's great, other people thinks it's trash, and then within that scene where uh, Michael Corleone's doing his thing, he goes through a diabetic shock, People will be like, this is the greatest acting scene of all time. All people's like, no, it's the worst acting scene of all time. And that's the way I feel uh, about two. You just got these stark contrasts. But on another note, I put it in there because I'm on my uh, birthday recovering from the craziness of losing that game. And uh, so I, my wife said, don't, you're not touching that computer. You're not, you're not doing any work there. And, uh, well, I got that. So I, I kind of snuck off. I, 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 I might have disobeyed her for a second. So I checked some of the comments, see what was going on. And somebody's like, uh, do you hear two is in concussion protocol? Said, what? <laughs> what? I'm like, out, but they pull you back in. I have never seen a franchise. I mean, if you step on the outside and look at the Miami Dolphins, they're the most intriguing and exciting and uh, amazing, thrilling franchise in the league I mean, if you don't care about winning, if you just want stories. So I find out that Dewey went into uh, concussion protocol. I'm like, what? I, said, I put it down, woke up this morning, started answering my comments, and then uh, I was getting ready to do the podcast, and I hear, kaboom! Some dude slams into a uh, telephone pole, knocks out the electric grid for a couple hours. So I'm behind on my comments, a little behind on my podcast. But uh, I'm, I'm to get it out to you today. And what I want to go over is, just like Michael Corleone and uh, uh, Al Pacino's acting scene, you got some on the left, greatest ever, some on the right, uh, worst ever. But to his concussion, in all seriousness, it's absolute context to both of these sides when you look at the entirety, but specifically also focusing on this game. And I want to cover into uh, cover that today, the both sides and, and what really is coming out of it, and be very serious with it, because I know this kid, whatever you think about him as a quarterback, he has been a pinata for both sides, for the media. You shake to it and you get something from him. This is a human being who's in a very, very bad situation. And on top of that, you know, or s below that is their actual football X's and O's and the value to the franchise and what it means to the fans. We're at a critical stage, both this year and going forward in the long term. Saw a couple of things uh, about what's being said about the situation. I'm going to comment on that as well. So I want to thank you for stopping by here in a wacky, wacky world of the Miami Dolphins uh, football talk and the Miami Dolphins franchise. I appreciate it as always. Uh, I want to give you guys a shout out. And I want to give a shout out to Ace Pred, my sponsor, because without the two of you, this show ain't going down. Ace Per Head's betting software is the premier white label platform for bookies to manage their players and grow their sportsbook operation. Click the link in the description below to get set up in minutes. Ask for the Curtis promo and get a special introductory discount. Seasons and, uh, I mean, you know, it was already like teetering on, you know, a shotgun on a China doll type thing. But people out there, you know, Teddy's going to get put in and like maybe he'll save the season. It ain't happen. I mean, it could, it could. But the big piece of this offense is based around to his quick release. And whether you think the guy is the worst quarterback in the universe or you think he's the greatest, we could all come together on the reality that his release is ultra fast. It's almost as quick as Dan Marino's. You go back, watch Dan, watch him, ultra quick. And this helps a lot of these quick reads, quick hits inside and over the middle, the RPOs and all that stuff. So Sands, that quick release, 
it's really going to constrict the philosophy and the scheme of this offense. And we've seen it before. I mean, we got one play with Teddy, and he got knocked out, supposedly. I don't know, whatever. And then we saw with Skyler, and some people are saying, just put Skyler in, you know, because at least we're going to see what we got with this guy. Because the reality is, and I'm going to get into the other part, but Skyler is going to struggle big time. This offensive line has got a lot of issues. We don't like to commit to the run. And in some ways, it's not all McDaniel's fault. He just doesn't have the personnel. Sometimes he'll take uh, Ingold and have him play tight end because we don't have any real blocking tight ends. And really, I think if you ran inside zone, a little bit of eye and offset eye, weak and strong, you'd really have a pretty good ability to run the football. And you need to because the pass blocking isn't so hot. Tehran has looked pretty good considering all the beatdowns. But I've showed how uh, Jones struggles in, in certain situations. Shell struggles in certain situations. And even Hunt, uh, when he's a little uncertain to who's next to him, he has a tendency to, to get lost in swaps and switches. And so this kind of puts problems on good pass rushing teams and when the play goes to a certain level in the clock. So whoever we put in there is going to struggle if they don't have the quick release. I like... Teddy, I think he could do a lot of good stuff. But for this, for another offense, he might be better than Tilla, you know? But for this offense, I don't think he would be. But yeah, he'd be, you know, just whatever. But for this one specifically, you need a fast release. And Tua has that and it's going to get lost. And he's a little more fleet footed, a little more agile on, th on the throw, on the move, and leaping when the. Uh, the Sting Blitz comes in. We saw that this week. What a beautiful pass to Waddle. And Teddy just doesn't really have that. And we don't have the offensive line or the run game. Because these running backs that we have, most written Wilson, everybody was going crazy. But you could see they just lack. They, they're good in certain things. But they're average to slightly above average at most. So we're going to be highly constricted. And I expect both to struggle. And why I understand putting Skyla in to see what you got. We saw that with Tua. Uh, Gross and Greer forced them in to see what they got, and it wasn't the right situation. It began a snowball of problems. When you, you get to take a quarterback and you put him into this league, you want him to have at least a solid framework. It doesn't have to be the greatest, but a solid framework. And Hill and Waddle are excellent and all, but you're going to be going against Belichick. They have a good secondary. They can pass rush. It's not going to be conducive environments for Skyler. And if you want him to be the future, you've got to build this kid up right because he's gotten a snot beat out of him, and I don't think he's learned too much. When you run around with a chicken with its head cut off and getting pounded over the head with a mallet, the only thing you learn is, I can take a beating in this game. And it's not setting up the best environment for him. Uh, you, you know, So I could see him getting put in this week for the future, but I just don't think this offense is prepared to really set him up and begin that good setup point for him. And this is why I do like Teddy better. Teddy understands the game. He's had good setups. He's had bad setups. He's kind of the backup now going forward. He kind of understands the whole thing. He's savvy enough to like kind of make this stuff happen and not let destroy him. He understands the inner workings. But Skyler is too green, and I don't want him to get beaten to the point where it it diminishes the future because honestly, and now I'm gonna get into the big thing. You can see right here in this play, uh, they they I saw it what I saw when I first saw it, I said something, but I didn't say it in the pocket. It's like, oh, but he because he bounced up. It didn't I didn't connect one and one. But you can see right here, he gets wrapped, the one arm gets held, the back of the head bounces off the carpet. Not a terribly bad hit, but it's a clear sign that this kid isn't healthy. And it also shows, you could see, he's like, I don't remember what play I called. I mean, that was like, that was weird. You don't remember? It still didn't click. It's amazing. This, this happened the last time when he played the Bills. And I don't know why, because I really understand the, the, the noodle getting uh, shaken around, but it never seems to click quick for me. So we saw in that second half the three interceptions. And when you go back after that hit, things kind of get wonky. And they get more and more wonky and for those who said Tua is going to be a very very good quarterback and 
people who would say, oh, well, look at this game, three picks in a row. Well, Breeze, if you look at his third season, he had three picks. He had a terrible season. It was like 14 and 15. 14 touchdowns, I think, and 15 interceptions. And it was so bad, that's why they went for Rivers, or when they were going to push him forward. Uh, so, yeah, it was a bad game, but it was a terrible time, and it really was fuel to the fire that this kid doesn't have it. Because he looked so good in the first half, and it just was so confusing how you got that switch. So for the people who thought this kid could play, you really can't use that. His head was clearly scrambled. You go back and look at the first half, um, leading up to that, and he was having a good game until the pressure started coming. There was a lot of pressure, and I need to go over the tape. I haven't really gone over it because of the car crash and all that stuff, but from my first watch and a little bit of the second watch, I started seeing some stuff, and this is what I talked about, the pass rush, the good secondary, why we had a run, why we had to be physical inside, but this kid's second half is legitimately kind of wiped away a little bit because we've never seen that before. And when he's like, I don't remember, and now he's in concussion protocol. So this puts the thing into the favor of those who really do believe this kid could be something. But for those who think that Tua is never going to make it in the NFL, it also confirms stuff there as well. Sadly, uh, I don't think his ability was ever terrible. I thought he had a lot of good traits. I thought he should have had a different offense built around him. I think this kid could play and be something. Whether it was, it's not going to be the elite of the elite, I don't know if it would go to Super Bowl, or maybe it could, whatever. This kid had some traits. He was good in some a few different things, but the Achilles heel is why I didn't want him drafted, was the injury on the hip, the injury history, and now you're seeing clearly this kid cannot take a hit on the head anymore. Now, he might take a long period off, and it, it might stabilize that, but from everything I've read, and I've known some people who've taken some a couple of hits, and it just it seems to get faster and faster and easier and easier. And that first hit against the Bills, maybe if he got pulled out and he'd taken his time, but those two, it's clear now, it was a concussion against the Bills because whatever the back was, he didn't know he was concussed this game or he would have got himself out after all the knowledge. I told you, you can get concussions and can keep going. So this guy, I would say now it's really, really clear that Bill's game, it was concussion. Then four, week, four days later, he had a second concussion. Now it's like about a month and a half later or whatever it is, he had his third concussion. It's terrible, but this kid needs to be shut down. He, need, it's, it, 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 he needs not to see another game this year. And sadly, from a Dolphins perspective, he's going into the last year of his contract. And you can't bank on that. I mean, we might have no choice because we don't have any options. We're not going to have a lot of money unless Brady decides to re-return <laughs> like he was going to uh, the last year at a super cheap price or something. But he'll probably maybe even go to San Fran or something. I don't know, whatever. But we really have limited choices. So this kid might come back this year, but I still don't think he, I think the kid's career might be in real jeopardy. Because that hit on the back of the head is going to happen again. Again. And I just don't see this as a quarterback that you can bank on long term unless he decides to take the lowest, the low. I mean, but you've got to move forward to have consistency. It's okay if you're a seven or an eight out of 10, if you're consistent, you know, but you can't be. You can't be in and out, in and out, and then worry about a couple concussions and you're done for the season type stuff. It just not, it doesn't allow you to build the team right. Now, I also heard, uh, I think it was Channing Crowder said, it's not the Dolphins' fault for this concussion. And in a way, I'll say, of course, obviously this concussion here wasn't their fault. You know, I don't even think the first one was. I think that he didn't know and whatever. I mean, I don't know. But... When you look back at how this kid was installed, and it doesn't matter if you like him or think he was going to, from a very logical and very rational standpoint, he's an asset to your team. 
He has weaknesses. He has skill sets. You decide to draft him with the fifth overall. That means that asset value is extraordinarily high. And whatever come, whatever, come what may, you've got to make the most out of this player, this asset to your team, this skill set with the positive and negatives, and get the most of it until either A, you stop and you know this is your guy, or B, you find someone better than him or to replace him. When we put him in and rushed him in 2020, he didn't get any extra snaps leading up to the week of his insertion as a starter, which says staff wasn't involved. Gailey, as I've said a thousand times before, said that he'll get his start when he's healthy enough and he knows the playbook. He didn't know both. Gailey's playbook is all about understanding the playbook so you can manipulate it week to week against your opponent and use little bits and pieces to take advantage like Fitz does. Doesn't mean Fitz is a better quarterback, but he understood the playbook and he was able to take advantage of Gailey's system. Two, it wasn't. He was forced in by Ross and Greer because they had Brady in the background and they want to know, is he our guy or not? Because we're going to go get Brady. Because they're having problems with Flores already. And they want to win. And Ross is getting older and he wants to, you know, shine for the fans and for himself. So you force him in, doesn't go well, media gets on him, takes a little bangs, comes back the next year, somebody is in charge. You could say it was Flores that decided to get rid of Flowers and Karras and strip down this offensive line to be the worst in the NFL. If that's the case, Greer has said, Flores is insane, Stephen Ross. We've got this asset. He's got an injury history. Offensive line is the most critical thing for a quarterback. We've got to keep these guys. But that's not what happened. They shipped off Flowers for nothing. They let Karras walk. And then they had the worst offensive line because they brought in Eichenberg, who's terrible, and Jackson Stark, who's terrible, and the rest of the crew. And the whole thing was the worst offensive line that I can remember. And that's not how you set up a kid. So you had to throw short all day to keep everybody in and put two and three guys in the routes. A little bit like we were seeing this year, but we didn't have Hill and Waddle to be able to make hay with only two and three guys going out in the routes. And we had no genuine run game. So that's not setting the kid up in year two. So he gets some beat ups and then you come back the next year. And then you patchwork the offensive lineup. You stick with Eichenberg. You stick with Jackson. You get Tehran, which is great. And you get Connor, which is great. But Tehran is in and out because of injuries. And then you decide for a heavy vertical offense. If you're looking to protect a off- uh, quarterback and you're looking to have him grow into his game, vertical means harder. The shorter the pass, the easier it is to complete. It also means you're not getting as many yards, but... It is easy to complete and easier to protect your quarterback. That's why Brady lived on that for years. So you put him in this vertical offense, which was Dan Marino's offense 2.0 without Dwight Stevenson. So you had a lesser line and a quarterback who's lesser, who's not able to really handle the load the way he needs to with this porous offensive line and his heavy vertical game. And so takes a few hits, not all involved with his vertical offense, but in the same token, You weren't protecting him. So this kid has not been set up. You had this valuable asset, and you haven't made the most of the opportunity, whatever it was. Even if it was just to get this kid to play as good as you could, to trade him, to get somebody else. It was a screw job, not for him, but the whole thing. It's the whole Dolphins thing. People keep saying the same thing. Same Dolphin season, different faces. Because it's the same background. The people in charge doing the same thing. It's the same poor offensive line. It's the same lack of a running game. Offensive lines and run game creates consistency, protects the quarterback, rests the defense, and while it's not glamorous, it creates that consistency. But year in and year out, we have the worst offensive line. So this concussion by Tua is not the fault of McDaniel. It's not the fault of Greer or Ross in the exactitude of that moment. But the setup wasn't wise. You've got a quarterback who has an injury history. Why do you make him go vertical? Why don't you give him the best offensive line you can? And why don't you run the football more? I mean... 
It's pretty simple. But now you have a damaged quarterback, a quarterback that might not be your long-term future. He might play next year, but there's no way you can put a fifth-year option on him for 20 or 30 million or whatever it is. There's no way you can ex- assign him to an extension. And for the kid's sake, he's married, he's got a young baby. That head is now highly damaged. And if you go back and look at what some of these experts were saying after that second concussion, they said you need months off to recover this brain, and this last concussion is too much. Tua's career is in the red as far as jeopardy. And I don't think the kid was the greatest quarterback of all time being held back, but he was clearly being held back. We always do that with everything. We have done that for years. I remember when Philbin wanted to draft Carr over Tannenhill, and then we had the background going and fighting. It's over and over and over again that people at the top are contentious and somewhat inept. And this doesn't mean McDaniel is, but he was a green coach. He, he, he wasn't our first. We were told in 2019, Ross was out but he was in. He was in the background. Then we were told that we're going to do a quarterback, uh, a coach search, and if the coach wants the quarterback, then I'm with, we're with him, but if the coach wants to change it, then we'll do that too. That was like a, that's what he said. But really, he had Peyton and Brady already in the wings, but he was telling us something else. And then McDaniel was brought in on the backside, and then he was given lots of different pieces. But to me, McDaniel, just like Tua, would have been best served with an offensive line. A bozo like me said, draft Zach Tom. Zach Zach Tom was starting last week, and he played pretty well. And we drafted EZ and Tyndale, who might be good players, but you need an offensive line. So Tua is clearly on the ropes in his career, in his career as a Miami Dolphin. It's not hate, it's truth. I want the kid to be, this is a game. He's made millions of dollars. If he stops today, he'll take care of his kid and his family for a very long time. And he can relax. But his health is a major, major, major concern. And you can't really go forward. I like the kid's talent. This season is hanging. And I don't think we're going to go to the playoffs now. I think we're going to probably lose one of two, or maybe two of two. And what will the media say? Well, we were going to do it, but, you know, Tua, we just need the right quarterback and, you know, maybe replace the D.C. And no, the next year, we're going to do it. This is the year. That's what's going to happen. Maybe it is. But it's got to go back to the leadership. McDaniel was a green coach who wasn't the first option. He was probably second or third or maybe somewhere around there. He's green. Greer brought in, right or wrong, all this talent which demanded big success this year. He didn't get a chance. McDaniel did not get a chance to develop, to say, holy cow, I'm doing this crazy job I never did before and the toughest job in the game in the world with only 32 people doing it. And I'm going to coach and I'm head coach and I'm going to call. Let me feel my way through, kind of like what Flores did. Flores was just like, you're never going to win. And then he started winning when he wasn't supposed to win. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. That was a great opportunity for him to fail and learn. McDaniel had to come out of the gate hot, and that's not easy. So I don't know about McDaniel. I don't think he was put in the best situation either. And Greer, too, who I'm not a fan of, I'm sure Ross was telling him, we got to win now, we got to win now. And he's like, well, wait, 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 we got a new coach. Who knows what he's saying in the background. But it goes back to the guy who cost us a pick, who told us in 2019 that he was out. It's crazy if you keep doing the same thing over and over. But he was in there trying to force things out, go behind the coach's back. Likely the guy, most likely, who put two in in 2020. So he is the problem. Ross is the problem. I feel for Tua. I feel for McDaniel. And sadly, I'd hate to say it, but I feel for Greer too. I'm sure he was happy with what was going on with Flores until Ross got in there and started telling, oh, we need Brady and we need... It's Ross. 
Ross is the problem. Ross is responsible, ultimately, because he's the leader. So here we are, fans. Let's see how it plays out. Maybe the what comes back magically. Maybe Teddy turns out to be the greatest quarterback and may take us. Maybe Skyler's as great as everybody was saying. He leads us to the postseason and we go to the Super Bowl. Or is the quarterback of the future? And that all might be true. We'll see. But you got to be clear. Tua has been compromised, whatever level he's been. The kid played really well this game until his head got rattled. You can stand on, he's just not able to take a hit. That's fair. But then it's also fair to admit this kid was playing pretty darn good. So look at Ross, look at the setup, look at the framework, look at the guys in charge, leadership, not Greer. Not McDaniel, not Tua, start with Ross. Because that's where it's always going to be. He's the guy you need to look to for answers. See how it plays out, guys. I feel bad for Tua. Those out there who are really big fans of Tua, I feel bad for you. You want to see this guy do well. I know there's a lot of people who didn't want to see him do well, but Dolphins might not find anybody better. Just think about how poor the quarterback play was. From Tua all the way to Marino. A little there with Pennington, which is all baby passes because he had no arm. A little bit of Tannehill one season was big volume passes, but you knew something was up. And then you had a, a, a more for a little bit. That's it. So who knows what's going to happen and what's going to be around the corner. Well, let's see. The drama continues as the Dolphins turn. Curtis saying, thanks for staying to the end. Please like, comment, subscribe. Just enjoy it. See what happens. See what happens. Maybe miracles will, will come for us. Game for the Bills. Maybe one day, too, we can celebrate. Catch you next time. Be well. Go Fins. Start building your own online sports book today by getting signed up with acebred.com service that allow you to book action on sports from all around the world.